G'day, welcome to this episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel. My name is Chris Muir, I'm an ADF Product Manager based in Perth, Australia. In today's episode, we continue with the subset of episodes looking at ADF Architecture Patterns. In the previous is issue, or I should say episode, we looked at the cylinder pattern where we started to break our application up into workspaces where the workspaces contain bounded task flows and model logic that was relating to one business area. Overall, the ap overall application would have multiple cylinders as such, multiple workspaces, and they would be reconstituted into a main application. Now, in that particular episode, we talked about a theoretical problem that you may hit when building very large applications. Now, what is a large application? It's hard to tell, but you can imagine that there is an actual limit to the size of the applications we can build because once you start adding more and more logic and more and more ADF code and more and more general code to your application, eventually when your application starts up, it's just gonna take out so many resources, gonna require so much memory and CPU that, hey, even a basic JVM, a Java virtual machine, won't be able to run it. So what we'd like to look at in this particular episode is a solution to that called the pillar architectural pattern, which attempts to address this issue, come up with some solutions so that we can break our applications up to run on multiple JVMs. So let's talk about that now. Before we delve into the actual pillar pattern, let's take a little segue and look at a area of building construction or engineering, which gives us some insights into the problems that we're going to get into here. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this particular building, but this is the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. I hope I pronounced that right. And currently this is the largest man-made structure which you can actually inhabit and go to the top of. There are taller buildings in this, I believe. Um, maybe the Warsaw Radio Tower or some other buildings which are more tower-like. But this building, in terms of actually accessing it and people getting into it, is currently the world's largest construction. <laughs> it's likely not to be in a few years. These things are all, people are always trying to build, uh, break this world record. But this building really is a fascinating building to visit. If you ever fly through the Dubai International Airport, you will likely see this building as you come in. It's really central to the whole city. And if you have a chance to go and visit it, it really is a fantastic piece of architecture. Um, when you look at it, it's just so considerably large. Um, it's just an amazing thing to stand at the bottom of. Now, with this building and other buildings like it, there is some interesting things that occur that are, don't occur in smaller buildings. Now, you would kind of think that, hey, you've been to skyscrapers, you've been into large towers before, and you know generally how these buildings work. You know that you've got to go up into lift wells and catch a lift up to the top, and that sometimes can take some time, but generally you think that, hey, all these buildings, eventually we just keep on building them larger and larger and larger, and hey, what's the difference? But as this article here from Gizmodo makes a point of that, when you start building buildings at this really large scale, you do hit some unique engineering issues that you wouldn't necessarily get on smaller buildings. So if your experience is of building 10 story buildings, 50 story buildings, you may not actually have hit some of the unique challenges that engineers and architects need to address in building buildings that are as high as this. So what are some of the issues that they get into in buildings like this? One example is you can't really have a lift well that runs from the top to the bottom of one of these buildings. The fact is, is that the cable and the elevator are so long and so heavy that it would snap and essentially you'd plummet to your death if you got into an elevator that tried to undraw you from all the way from the top to the bottom. So in order to solve that problem in a building of this size, they actually need to build a number of staggered lift wells. So from the first floor, you might catch a lift up to the 20th floor, and the 20th floor you get off and catch a lift from the 20th to the 40th floor, and so on and so forth. Essentially, the, again, you have to change the architecture internally and change the construction of the building to suit some of the physical limits that we're actually hitting here. And what's really interesting about this is there is an analogy to our ADF architecture. If our applications are getting so large that the JVM can't support them, then we're going to need to come up with a different sort of architecture and particular solutions to solving that particular problem. On returning to the pillar pattern or pillar architectural pattern for ADF applications, let's talk about some of the characteristics of applications built on this particular uh, pattern. 
Now, unlike the cylinder pattern where we had cylinders with related better task flow workspace, uh, better tasks, I should say, and model projects that were then consumed by an ADF library jar into a main orchestrated or central master application. The difference with the pillar architecture is each one of those cylinders becomes an actual application in their own right. They are actually deployed as EAR or enterprise archives. They're deployed as separate applications. But the key here is, is while we might technically break the application up into these separate applications that we deploy, and from your perspective as a developer, they are actually separate applications. From the user's perspective, we take great care into making it feel as if they are actually the same application. So even if the user switches between applications, okay, and um, in your application you might provide buttons or links to um, make them switch between the two applications, you need to make it feel as if they're still navigating within the same application. So logically, it's one big fat application, but physically it's actually separate applications. Now as usual, let's look at this diagrammatically to explain this a little further. So here you can see an architectural diagram which is very similar to the cylinder architectural pattern that we saw earlier on. In the right hand side in the common workspace we can see that we've got our typical task flow templates, page templates and so on. Maybe our most, re, uh, I guess, our reusable components that don't change a lot. I mean, Once you've defined your page template and done a few layouts you're not likely to keep on changing that all the time. However, on the left hand side of the diagram we can see what in the previous episode would have been our cylinder workspaces and in these cylinder workspaces no we're talking about pillar workspaces here we can see that they do include the model project with their entity objects view objects application module and so on and they even do include one to many banner task flows that are related to some sort of logical grouping such as say financials or HR or procurement However, the difference from the cylinder architecture and the pillar architecture is that you can see in each one of the pillars that they in fact define their own unbounded task flow. So they are, like just every other application out there, they require at least one unbounded task flow to orchestrate or bring all the bounded task flows together to create the actual application. And then also different from the cylinder architecture, these aren't reconstituted and then published and subscribed uh, in, via an ADF library jar into a, ma a master or a, a composite application. The fact of the matter is each one of these is deployed as their own application in their separate own ear or application archive files to your application servers. What about from a design consideration perspective of the pillar architecture? What are we going to think about? Well, given you've taken your original application and you've now broken up into multiple applications, you now have the opportunity to think about, well, should you deploy those all on one WebLogic server managed server? Or should you put it across multiple managed servers? Should you break it up onto multiple WebLogic server clusters? Remembering that the goal here was that your applications got so large that you might want to put parts of your application onto different infrastructure so they don't necessarily interfere with each other. Okay, So if you've got applications that are running on two separate WebLogic server clusters, then the resources are dedicated for the first application. Those resources are for it. The other CPU and memory resources on your separate WebLogic server cluster for the second application. So you're really breaking things up and allowing the applications to you know, effectively be segmented because of that original issue that the applications are just getting too large. Other design considerations that come into play though is that well, like we said, from the user's perspective, we want this to feel seamless as they move between applications. And very straight off, one of the things that you want to do, a very important thing that you want to do, is you don't want the user continuously logging in and out of these applications as they move across them. So you need to consider to bring in a single sign-on solution such that the user, once they're logged into one part of the application or logical application, that when they move between physical applications, they don't have to log in again to the second one. They're already logged in. Another consideration is that of the overall UI layout, the menuing structures, the look and feel. You really, from again, the user's perspective, want to make it feel like it's one seamless application. Now, if you have any background in Oracle Fusion applications or you've been using JDeveloper for a while, you'll know that the uh, Fusion apps provided to ADF something called the ADF UI shell or the dynamic tab shell. And the goal of that shell 
from the Fusion Applications perspective was to apply that page template with all its additional functionality across applications such that from the user's perspective it really did sort of feel like it had, it was one sort of seamless navigation model across those applications. Now you don't have to use the ADF UI shell, you can use your own, you can build your own page template, your own functionality. But again, the goal here is that you want to make one application look like the next application. So you'll need to get some UI standards in place, some UI layout guidelines, some page templates in place, menuing structures, and so on and so forth, in order to provide that seamless look and feel. Another additional concern is, well, the issue of passing state between the applications. Imagine you've got a financials and then a procurement type application where you're dealing with a customer and when the user moves between the two applications they need to be dealing with the same customer between the two applications as such. Now typically applications don't share state. Okay, They don't, they're actually separate applications and they have different memory models. So if you want that sort of seamless state sharing between applications you're going to need to find a mechanism in order to do that. Now there isn't a one size fits all or one solution to all of these problems because there are multiple different ways to do this. It really is a separate presentation in its own right. But if you think about it, you can pass state between applications by using, for instance, URL parameters. Or, for example, at a completely another extreme, the Oracle database. You can pass values down between one application and bring them up in another application. Or you can use the whole Fusion middleware layer with SOA type solutions and so on and so forth. Or even WebLogic Server, if you're running applications within the same cluster, it has a proprietary solution to sharing state. But what solution is right for you? Well, I don't know. But again, this is something that you will need to consider in your overall application design. What are some of the advantages of the pillar architecture pattern? Well, firstly, well, if you think about it, you've now got applications separate applications, not one large application. So if you need to make a change to a part of the overall logical application, you necessarily only need to do it to one of the pillars, not all the pillars. So the good advantage of that as well is, well, you might need to bring that application down and bring it back up to get the latest change in there, but you don't need to bring all the other pillars down when you're applying that change. In addition, like we said, of course, one of the massive advantages of the pillar architecture is your application is actually broken up into discernible separate deployment artifacts that can run by themselves. They are self-contained as such. And as such, because you can then put them onto different infrastructure, different web logic server clusters, different servers, different VM uh, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. If you've got an application that requires a lot of resources, you can go and put it on a dedicated hardware. Whereas if you've got a bunch of applications that don't require a lot of resources, you could put them, for instance, on a bunch of shared infrastructure. You've got a lot of options there and now splitting the application load up over multiple applications deployed to multiple servers. Now, the disadvantages of this particular architectural pattern, well, there's the concept of implementing single sign-on. Now, single sign-on itself isn't a negative or a disadvantage, but actually implementing it and paying for the licenses and the actual extra infrastructure is going to be a disadvantage. In addition, that concept of sharing state between applications, you're going to do, need to pick, design, and build in a state sharing mechanism, and this will add complexity to your overall applications and how they communicate to each other. Okay, it's definitely not a simple case of you've got one managed session level scoped bean in your application where information is being shared between the different banner task flows. No, you're going to need to find an entirely new mechanism and make your programmers aware of how to use that mechanism because it's not going to be something that they're necessarily familiar with in a standard JSF or ADF application. There potentially are quite a few other architectural challenges with this particular pattern, but these are the two obvious ones when you, uh, we talked about the solution previously. And that concludes our look at the pillar architectural pattern. As you can see, it is worthy for some customers because you'll be building a very, very large applications. But if you're not going to be building applications of that scale, then maybe one of the other architectural patterns is for you. Like we said right back at the first episode in the set of ADF architectural pattern episodes on the ADF Architecture TV, that with the patterns, there is no penultimate pattern. You need to assess each pattern, the pros and cons versus your business requirements, versus your technical requirements, versus your team skills and your infrastructure to find the one that suits you. And the pillar architecture pattern is designed for customers that are building very large applications. 
we have one episode to go with the ADF Architecture TV episodes on ADF Architectural Patterns. We've got to look at the multi-access channel pattern, okay, and it's a pattern to do with uh, ADFBC SDOs. And in that same episode, we'll also look at an anti-pattern, okay, a pattern where I implemented, or I was responsible for coming up with the design, a pattern for an application, which potentially took reuse too far. And there's some valuable lessons to learn from looking at this particular pattern and going, hmm, yeah, Chris, that maybe wasn't the best thing to do. So I hope you've enjoyed this particular episode today, the second last ADF Architectural Pattern episode in the ADF Architecture TV series. And then we'll be looking at this last episode on the multi-access channel pattern and anti-pattern. And then we'll be concluding this set of presentations and we'll be moving on to new topics very soon. So thanks again for your time today and I hope we'll see you in the next episode.